I think it's safe to say that hand traps in Yu-Gi-Oh are a necessary evil at this point. When you think about how modern Yu-Gi-Oh is played, it's hard to really consider what the game would be like without hand traps, without considering that there are just some decks that just get way too much off of very little. The only counterplay or counterbalance to that is to be able to interact with the opponent on their first turn. So hand traps are just this necessary function of the game to counterbalance the insane amounts of power creep and combos that we currently have in the modern game. We can break hand traps down into two functions. There's the high impact hand traps, which are hand traps that can potentially stop an entire turn from a single activation, but maybe require a little more setup or for your deck to be based around them or for the opponent to play into them. Whereas there are low impact hand traps that may only stop a single line of play, may only stop a single interaction, but they don't really require your opponent to play into them as much. If we take the first place list from YCS Rally, Snake Eye has been a deck that has been very popular because of not only its ability to play a really small engine that can recur itself through multiple interruptions with this insane grind game, but also because of its just large amount of space to play hand traps, right? So. We see 16 hand traps in main, three Astrinib, three Veiler, three Droll, one Mourner, and then three, and then Crossout is like the anti-hand trap thing. So it's like they have so much space for non-engine that they can just afford to play the three Crossout, not lose any sleep over it. There are 10 low impact hand traps and six high impact hand traps, and the 10 being Ash, Veiler, Mourner, and Imperm, where these may stop a single line of play but it may not stop an entire turn. Whereas like Nib and Droll are hand traps that can potentially stop an entire turn of play, but the opponent has to play into them. As we come to realizing why hand traps are so big in Yu-Gi-Oh is because they work. They do stop the opponent from doing things. And as a pilot yourself, you have to know how to maneuver around some of these hand traps. Certain hand traps do not put the fear of God into you. If you are not actually learning how to play around or how to dodge them constantly throughout your combo lines, you're prone to falling victim to them. Example, Joel and Lockbird locks you out of searching for the turn after you, you've committed just one search. You, cannot, you, you can no longer draw or search for the rest of the turn. If you have a combo line that requires three or four searches throughout the turn to be at its proper function and you continue to play the deck as if Droll does not exist, you are going to get punished by Droll. Same thing with Nibiru. Five or more summons, your board gets wiped. If you do not set up a way around Nibiru, whether it's something like Divine Temple with Snake Eye, something like Cross Out, or an interaction that actually gets rid of Nib or negates the Nib altogether, then you are prone to fall victim to it once you've summoned five or more monsters. It just gets to clear your field and that gives your opponent full range to just take advantage of the situation. To pilot a rogue deck, like in this video will be Goblin Biker, learning how to play around hand traps is going to be really essential to getting better and getting results with a deck like this. Because not only do you have to know how to play around engines and know how to play around end boards and situations, but for going first, if you want to impose your will on the opponent, you're gonna need to know how to play around a few of these things. And I think from my time playing Goblin Biker, I think at most you can play around two hand traps. I think once you get to three hand traps, depending on if they're low impact or high impact, if they're three low impact hand traps, you might be able to survive. If it's one high impact hand trap mixed with two or more low impacts, you're still losing. And then if it's both high impact hand traps, like Shifter or Droll or Nib, you're probably not gonna get that game. Statistically, if someone's playing around 16 hand traps they're almost guaranteed to draw one the ability for them to draw a single hand trap is way over it's basically guaranteed that they will at least get the one hand trap in their hand the ability for them to draw two hand traps drops a bit but it's still close to 70 percent seven out of ten hands they will be seeing another card a second hand trap to stop you and i think that is where you want to go that is what you want to prepare for because once you start looking at three hand traps which is only like one out of three um hands right so three out of ten hands they will potentially get a third hand trap and i've even had a situation before where someone has had like four hand traps cross out plus 
starter and it was just the most frustrating thing ever because of how much they get to stop you and they still get to play so it's a really ridiculous situation sometimes when you're looking at how many hand traps certain people are playing what's crazy is that this 30 percent chance of drawing three hand traps is a lot more common than you may think the chance of someone drawing any particular hand trap right so three in a five card hand is around 33 percent so they have the same chance of drawing any one particular hand trap as they do of drawing three hand traps. So if they need Droll, right, specifically, if they need Nib specifically, it's the same chance that they will draw Droll or Nib that they will drawing three hand traps with 16 hand traps in a they're at 41 but that doesn't change the statistics much it's still around three out of ten hands there's a minimal difference in their ability to draw three hand traps but the question is with a deck like goblin biker how do you play around certain hand traps from my testing and from my experience the best way for you to play around hand traps when you have a really linear combo line and combo strategy because half the time your combo line is just make a gabanga and then gabanga sets up everything else that's usually how it goes with goblin biker there is not a lot of workarounds for that there is no like workaround for how good gabanga is as a card unless you're just hard opening the cards that gabanga searches in a normal line in a normal one card combo line you are searching like three four maybe even up to five cards from your deck and that's why droll should put the fear of god into you if you're playing a goblin biker deck and so your goal as a goblin biker player is to always try to play around the droll or always try to play around the nib oftentimes you can't do both it's really rare that you can do you can play around both droll and nib and still have full combo and that's what makes Terra top kind of tough because Terra top is a one card starter even if you draw Terra top plus an extender because Terra top searches to talk at it doesn't actually play through droll same thing for Ziamin and for Itali. even though Ziamin is a great extender for uh giving you more power giving you a stronger end board and giving you more lines it's still completely weak to droll and, and even if you you can make a negate with Ziamin you're still susceptible to draw before that negate is made. So you, you need a little more versatility. You, like you need to work your problem solving skills a little harder to figure out how to play around hand traps with a deck like uh, Goblin Biker. We're gonna go into some of these lines. And I think like a good general rule of thumb is that for every low impact hand trap, you just need one more, one more extend. So for your Ashes, your Veilers, your uh, Imperms, you just need like one more e telly like terra top plus something else and you can probably play through them like more often than not you'll be able to play through those situations whereas with your high impact hand traps your droll your shift or your nib this is the kind of stuff that you're going to need to start doing i wanted to take a look at a card like buzzsaw shark it's a level four monster but it's not something that i'm seeing a lot of people play in their goblin lists and I think that may be incorrect. After spending some time learning how to play Shark, which I think is something of an underwhelming deck, I can say fully certain that Buzzsaw Shark is like the outlier in the Shark deck. You always want access to Buzzsaw Shark just, to, just because of how strong it is. And I want to showcase to you guys how strong it is here in a Goblin Biker deck, even in, in a deck that it doesn't, that it can't actually or that, is, that it wasn't actually made for. So, Buzzsaw Shark can target a water you control, which is itself. It summons from deck a fish monster with the same level, but a different name, and that monster that you summon cannot activate its effects this turn. Also, you cannot summon uh, from the extra deck, except exceed monsters for the rest of the turn. If this card is to be used for the exceed summon of a water, it can be treated as a three or five, and it's a level four, right? So it's a level four fish, and it can summon another level four uh, fish monster and so the one that I like to go for is the lantern shark and the reason why I like going for lantern shark here is because buzzsaw only summons from deck but if you open lantern shark uh, on top of buzzsaw then you can still then you can just normal lantern and lantern has like a marauding captain effect to summon out the buzzsaw shark so it's not a complete brick if you open it with the buzzsaw. That's why I kind of like these two guys uh, together in the same list. So three buzzsaw, one lantern, 
Also, because their ability to level manipulate allows them to go from rank 3s or rank 5s pretty conveniently. Now, that won't always come up, but the main reason why you play them is because you can go for Bahamut Shark, and Bahamut Shark can go into Toad, and then you can turn Bahamut Shark into Exceed Armor Fortress. Now, you see here that I'm detaching 2 to search 2. You do not have to play the Armored Exceed, and I will make this a point because I know some people don't want to play this particular Armored Exceed card, and I think that's fine. If you don't want to play this, you can just detach the 1, then summon the Duck Charger, and then that'll be detaching the 2nd, and then overlay into Dark Knight Lancer. But as, as you can see uh, that I'm going to do here, I'm going into Crystal Zero Lancer because I need that extra Exceed material to uh, detach for both Dug Charger and for Grand Entrance. So we're going into Dark Knight Lancer, and again, I'm only using Crystal Zero here because I'm using the Armored Exceed spell card. And it actually works out pretty well, right? So we get to detach one, summon out Dug Charger. Dug Charger then gets to search Grand Entrance, and then... I really like that Dark Knight Lancer can recycle your Exceed cards from Graveyard, so it can recycle the regular Armored Exceed, it can recycle your uh, Exceed Armor Exceed monsters and put them back into Extra Deck, and it's just really convenient. So now we can use uh, Grand Entrance to search a Mean Merciless, and then we can detach one from the Dark Knight Lancer to Special Summon it, right? We've already used our normal summon, so we need the extension, so we're going to need that second Exceed material. Which, again, if you did not search the Armored Exceed, you would not need Crystal Zero Lancer to get that second Exceed material, but it's fine, right? So now we can overlay into Gabonga. Gabonga can search the Clatter Splatter. And now we can use Grand Entrance's Affecting Graveyard just to detach one for free. We don't have to actually resolve the part where it adds a Goblin back to hand because that part is completely optional. It can basically just banish itself, detach one Exceed material, right? You do not have to add back. And then we can use Mean Merciless and Grave to detach the last material off of Gabonga to summon it, and because we did not use its effect earlier, its effect will be live now to special summon a Goblin Biker from hand. So now we get to summon out the Clatter Splatter, and Clatter gets to revive Dug Charger. Now we're sitting on three level threes here that we can then turn into an Ashura King. End phase, we can go for Gabonga. Gabonga can then attach our final Goblin Biker from deck, our Boom Mock. And now, how many interruptions are we looking at is the question here. So we know we have at least three in our front row. Gabonga can trigger when an extinguisher is detached. A Shuriken can, can trigger to negate a monster effect and destroy, and then totally can negate anything. It's an Omni negate. This allows us to play through Droll or Nib, but not both at the same time. Because if you get Drolled there, like you really don't want to get Drolled because then it's hard to detach the materials from your Exceed Armor Fortress, because then you can't detach both materials conveniently, and that makes it so like this cannot be used as a Exceed material until all of its Exceed materials are detached. So that's why Droll hurts this deck so much. With Toad here, that would make it a lot easier. Now, if they try to nib us after we toad, then we're screwed. But I think it's better to just hold or to use a negate on Droll than to try to hold, assuming that they're going to have a Nibiru as well. Because Droll plus Nib is crazy. That's a crazy hand. Droll plus like Ash, Droll plus Imperm, Droll plus Valor, that's understandable. But Droll plus Nib, that's crazy. You know, at that point, you got it. You know what I'm saying? You might as well just concede that point because... It's almost impossible to play through that without some, some kind of called by or cross out, regardless. So, Buzzsaw Shark, right? And as long as we time our interruptions correctly, we can always get um, the full value. So we use a, a Shuriking here. We're going to detach one. And now that we have the Clatter and Graveyard during our opponent's main phase, we can detach one to summon it. And I detached the Dug Charger here. You, you could detach the Boom Mock if you wanted as well. Um, it's really personal preference, it's just, I don't know if it's correct to detach from a King, right? If Dark Knight Lancer still had his XC material, we would detach from him. I think detaching from Gabonga isn't the worst thing either. But, uh, you want to use Doug this way, like, you want to revive Doug on your opponent's turn just so you can get the follow-up, right? It's, it's a free search, and at that point, they're probably not gonna Ash or Droll you during their turn unless they draw Ash for turn, but it, it really won't matter, right? So, and then if they try to have, like, any sort of touching the gate where that requires Doug to stay on field, you can chain full Armored Exceed to then uh, have it instant overlay into Cicada King. And then we can search something like Pile Up, or we can search another Grand Entrance. 
And he, here's the beautiful thing. I know Dark Knight Lancer is an interruption in itself if we get Armonic Seed interaction in Grave, but that interaction in Grave is not always necessary. And I think it's good to have an option to send Dark Knight Lancer for Toad if we're not worried about Toad being destroyed by battle, right? Because if we resolve for Armonic Seed, Toad can go up to potentially 5,000 attack this turn. I'm not too worried about Toad being destroyed by battle. And we still have another in interaction with Cicada King, and we still have another interaction with Gabanga. And there are still three more cards in our hand that are just not known at this point because we have not gone through them. So I think sometimes it is worth it to send Dark Knight Lancer to, to play with Totally Awesome just so you... If you feel like they may have some follow-up or like another situation where they may have a card that can put you in another situation, you can just keep the Toad on field just so you can play around the Omni Negate. Or you can you can continue playing with, with the Omni Negate. And yeah, so they activated Doug from hand, so we get the option to steal their Doug. So there's a new Exceed monster that came out in Legacy of Destruction, and it's not entirely clear how that Exceed monster can be used in a lot of different decks that aren't Ubel or that aren't Earth Machine that do, that do not have inherent access to level 10 monsters that can just summon themselves. So I think I figured out a convenient way for Goblin Biker to play this card if you feel like that's what you want to do. And Mother Spider Splitter is the one card line into Varudras Bringer of the End Times or whatever the hell his name is in TCG. So. Mother Spider Splitter can summon herself from hand for free while you control no monsters. You can tribute her, and you're locked into only being able to summon Exceed monsters for the rest of the turn in a Goblin Biker deck. Not a big deal. Then you summon up to three Baby Spider from your hand or deck, and if you do, they become level 5, and they can't be used as an Exceed material except for the summon of a Dark Exceed monster. So, four summons, you summon three Baby Spiders, right? You're not playing into Droll yet, which is good. Now they all become level five. And Baby Spider has a pretty interesting effect, right? So on field effect is that you contribute a dark monster and then increase the levels of all Baby Spiders you currently control by the level of the tributed monster. So as you're gonna see here, I'm going to tribute the level five Baby Spider and then both my Baby Spiders are gonna become level 10. And then I have a graveyard effect where you can pay half your life points Banish this card from graveyard and then detach one from a dark exceed monster that you control. Target a dark monster in your graveyard and then special summon it. It can revive another copy of itself. It can revive any dark monster from graveyard as long as you already have a dark exceed. And what's great is that now that we have pile up and that it's easier to get access to our crazy beast, crazy beast could be a, a potential good interaction for this even typhon if you don't need its bounce back maybe using typhon to or maybe using baby spider to detach from the typhon could be interesting so now we can overlay our two level 10s into our varudras and if you weren't already aware varudras is another omni except it requires us to detach one now we also have the option when we negate something to detach another material to destroy the card that we are negating. And that's kind of where this card becomes a little more interesting because if you can make this card with more exceed materials, like the more exceed materials you can make this card with, the stronger it becomes. But I think just overall two level tens is kind of fair and we just made it off of one card without using our normal summon and without playing into droll. As for the ratios of Mutter Spider Splitter you're going to be playing or like the deck size you should be playing it in, that's still up in the air. I, I don't I haven't seen much people talk about this card, so it's still personal preference. Creating a Varu Dross off of one card is really convenient, and now if we have our Doug Charger in hand, we get to detach one summon, and Doug then gets to search, we go for our grand entrance, and because we haven't used our normal summon yet, we're gonna go for Mean Merciless here. We're gonna normal summon a new Merciless to go for Gabanga. And kind of in like the same way as last time, we're gonna go for Exceed Armor Fortress. This time we're going to detach, and the de the materials that you detach here are important. We're gonna detach Mean Merciless and we're gonna detach Gabanga as well. So we're gonna add our two Armin Exceed cards. And with this scenario, I think you should be detaching two. I think it's hard to detach one and get away with it. You may have to use Grand Entrance if you only detach one, but it, uh, I think detaching two is a lot better here. So now you can use a Mean Merciless Engrave to detach the Doug Charger to summon itself. And now Mean Merciless can, you know, summon out the, the Clatter. And then Clatter can target Gabonga, bring it back. If they have Abyss Deal here, they have it. Do not negate Abyss Deal here 
no matter what you do. If you have like a tactics or something, sure, but you need to keep this for Nibiru. You have no other line of play after this. If they have a Droll, I mean, not a Droll, if they have a DD Crow or a Bestial, you just let it happen because that's fine. Gabonga is not gonna like make or break your end board. A Nib will, unless you can like confirm that they have a Nib in hand or not. Or like if you have something like a cross out in your hand as well, but this whole video is, you know, without cross out in mind. Yeah, uh, we get to go for a Dark Knight Lancer and we also get to go for Cicada King. I want to go for Cicada King here over some of our other Exceed monsters just because I want to have that extra interruption. I don't want my opponent to be drawing cards unless they have to, or unless Gossip Shadow is like the Exceed that I start with. In that way, I let my opponent draw a card, but uh, just in this scenario, I'd much rather sit on the Cicada King than on Gossip Shadow because I don't want to give my opponent a card during their turn and play into Tactics as well. Like, that's crazy. So, uh sort of same situation we just set the full armament exceed pass so let's say they have a monster effect that uh on field right so you can go for clatter and uh you can either detach from the dark knight or from the gabonga here it really makes no difference right we're we're detaching the fortress and then uh cicada king triggers it, it gives itself 500 more defense so Clatter gets to trigger here to bring back a Dug Charger. And then you can use Gabonga to actually chain block the Clatter because if they have like a Ghost Bell or something, they may be able to stop you from making an Exceed play. Gabonga can swallow a monster here. And because Cicada King does not actually remove the monster, it can, sw it can swallow the targeted monster or it can swallow, if they have another monster on field, it can swallow that as well. So now we get to summon out Dug, Dug effect to search. And then we have full armor to Exceed. And we go into something like Gossip Shadow. And then we get to go into Full Armored Exceed's other effect to Swallow. And we're still sitting on two interruptions here. So we, we didn't need to use the Swallow there. We could have waited until they committed to something stronger since the Swallow is non-targeting. But we were perfectly fine there to uh, stop our opponent. If they had a Nibiru, I feel like they would have used it just to get the last material off of Ball Draft. And I wish there was some way to replenish the material on this card that really just isn't. For Gossip Shadow, it, it can only target other numbers. So that's why you don't want to, or that's why you don't want to summon it during your turn. It could replenish the, the materials on like a number 90 or like a Cicada King, but it can't replenish the materials on a non-number XC monster. So. so let's drift away from the Goblin Biker side of things. What if we're not opening Goblin Biker Dug Charger, right? So what are some other extensions and lines that we can use to access our engine and still play around hand traps? e -Tally being the biggest one of them because e -Tally allows you to summon Ziamin and with any discard, which uh, in this case will be our Imperm, Foxy Tune can summon Deer Note from deck. Now, if you guys saw my 37 place deck profile, I was using Horse in the list. And I think now Horse is a little risky because people are going to be on Ghost Ogre for Tenpai, and they're going to be on Ghost Ogre for like a few other different matchups, like Voiceless, potentially the so Voiceless Tenpai, and some other matchups as well. And anything that uses Horus will get hard punished by Tenpai. Even Centurion loses to Ghost Ogre, I believe. This is going to be important for you to play around hand traps better. Yes, Ziamin does play into Droll. And yes, we could have avoided Droll if we Normal Summon Tour Guide went into Gossip Shadow, but I'd much rather get Drolled here than getting nibbed. But you still get to play getting Drolled. So we're gonna Synchro into our Punk Jam Driving Dragon Drive. We're basically still doing this just to play around Nibiru, right? We don't wanna um, get hard stuck to a nib. So we're gonna make Dragon Drive here. And Dragon Drive is gonna pay six to search. And then Deer Note can chain link two, uh, summon back our Foxy Tune. And then Ziamin can, can actually chain link three to chain block Deer Note and then give our Dragon Drive 600 more attack. So that way we're not losing the Ghost Bell, which is important. We do kind of lose to a Bestial or to a DD Crow, which I think people are going to be on as well, but we don't lose to Ghost Bell. You can't beat them all, but just getting better at beating the ones that you can are is just as important. So Dragon Drive actually gets to search as Ghost Ogre, right? If we are Droll, Dragon Drive does has the ability to mill the Psychic as well, so if you want to mill the Virtual World Hime Nian Nian, you could do that as well. I think the optimal play is to search Ghost Ogre just to give you one more interruption against uh, potential matchups.
So now we get to go into number 90, and it's all about using our normal summon, right? Thanks to E-Telly. So now we get to go Tour Guide, go for Mean Merciless, and at this point, you're protected from Nibiru. Gabonga, Gabonga, Search. And at this point, you guys probably already know the combo. It's just like Horus, Goblin Biker, except this time we're searching two instead of one, right? So in my Horus Goblin video, I was only searching the one, and then I was getting the grand entrance to get the second, but... Yeah, because we're using Crystal Zero Lancer as, as an example here, we're getting that extra XC material, so it doesn't matter if we if we can detach two. And we're gonna be reviving the Gabonga with the Clatter just so we have the extra interruption, and then we're gonna bring, be bringing back the Mean Merciless, overlaying into a Shuriking, set the one, and as you guys can imagine, once a Shuriking negates one, it can detach Gabonga because G Gabonga's gonna have a material after end phase. Detach from Gabonga, summon back, or you can detach the Doug to search the pileup or for another grand entrance, really personal preference. And then you get to overlay for a uh, Cicada King, or a number 75, whichever you feel is stronger, and you still have the Dark Knight Lancer interruption. So, we've been really good at setting up interruptions around monsters, but what if you needed an interruption around spells and traps? Well, ever since I started playing Goblin Biker, I was initially using a very particular spell and trap negate that I think we, we as a society, or as Goblin Biker players, have. Kind of stopped using now but as you can see here i did not search the ghost ogre with dragon drive i milled the virtual world with with it and so now we have virtual world to uh summon itself back whenever we need that extra level three body but we're gonna save it we're gonna save the nyan nyan for the sake of space and now i'm gonna show you guys why right so we're gonna go for fortress fortress is gonna detach two again you can detach one if you don't want to play the regular armored exceed but I'm finding that the regular Armored Exceed is coming up more and more. It, like, this is the best non-targeting removal that Goblin Biker has, um, especially on your turn. Because sometimes having to wait for your opponent's turn with full Armored Exceed is just not the play. It's just not the play sometimes. So we can go Crystal Zero into Dark Knight. Go Arrival, Search, Clatter, bring back the Bonga. And now we get to go Gold Pride Chariot Carry. And since I've never really made a combo video for this deck, um, I've never really talked about the Gold Pride theory. But uh, basically, Chariot Carry gets to be an amazing extender because it gets to dig you for something like Leon while also being able to overlay for something like Utopic Future. And I used to play this without Utopic Future. I wasn't a believer in the Utopic Future thing. So I would either go for the Gold Pride Star Leon, which is a Synchro, or I would use Gold Pride Leon to overlay. Which in this case, you're gonna see why that may not be happening. So I'm gonna use uh, Grand Entrance to detach one, uh, our, our second material from Chariot Carry, because it's not gonna need that material. It's not staying on field for the rest of the turn. So detaching that material to get some use out of it is actually really important. We can summon back our mean merciless and then we can special summon back the clatter that we recycled and then go into something like exceed armor torpedo detach two to draw one which you know if they have droll they have it but we get to go into utopic feature into utopic draco feature now we get to go for better luck next time pay some life and now we can summon out leon now normally if leon summoned back a gold pride monster from graveyard you would be locked into gold pride for the turn but we're not going to be summoning gold pride monster from graveyard we're not going to be using that effect instead we are going to be triggering the Yan because leon was summoned and now we have two level three wins to go into our totem bird so now we have a spell and trap negate a monster negate a dark knight lancer gabonga and another monster negate which are more solid negates than what we were holding before. And it's kind of going to be seen how important the full armor exceed will be in this line, because we could have just sat on Crystal Zero Lancer to resolve full armor exceed on the opponent's turn, but I don't know if that would have worked because then we would have had to detach one from 90 and that would have made 90 useless on our opponent's turn if they also had an interruption. Like if they had something on our turn like Nib, and we used 90, and then we had to detach the other one from 90, 90 would have just been a sitting duck. So I don't know if that would have been better or worse or what may have you, but it is what it is, right? 
So now Gabong gets to attach one. We're sitting on four interruptions at the least. If they summon two or more from extra deck, you actually get to activate full armor exceed here. Uh, turn Draco Future into potentially a Typhon. You could also use if they summon a monster with 3,000 more attack and activate its effect. You could also steal that monster with Draco Future and then use that monster as material for Typhon. If they summon two or more monsters from extra deck that turn, even if they battle any of our exceed monsters we can overlay into a zeus using any of our exceed monsters so that's also pretty important as well so now we're going to be looking at how to counteract a card like shifter so i think um shifter is kind of like this double-edged sword because any card that like banishes like shifter or defisher you really do not have to worry about droll you can play without remembering that droll exists and so you can go into something like Torpedo. And so this is kind of like made. So you you can either do this for your own Shifter. Like you can summon something like Draco Future. And if you're playing Shifter against like the right deck, like Snake Eye, Draco Future might just be enough because it's hard for them to actually make a board through Draco Future. So Draco Future plus Hand Traps or some sort of like small interruption might just be enough to stop their entire turn. But what if you wanted to take it a little further, do something a little more different? So we can go into Gabonga here, Gabonga get us our Doug. And because we use Terra Top, we don't really care about our materials getting banished. We can go Entrance to get uh, Grail Trio. And so this is really interesting because this, this is kind of like going first or going second. Uh, Grail Trio will be able to attack directly um, and then you can make like downward into Zeus and then having like a four material Zeus through a shifter is very impactful because then like if everything gets banished, that's even scarier and it, it may be a little harder to, to come back from for the opponent. So depending on if you're going first or going second, you may be able to make a pretty interesting situation like that. Now, shifter is a high impact hand trap. And as I mentioned before, it's hard for us to play around multiple high impact hand traps in the same turn we cannot play through droll and nib if we get drolled it is what it is because we cannot play through both at the same time so now i want to take it a, a one step farther uh, well i guess we can't get drolled under shifter actually so that's just not a good example but let, let's take it one step farther with uh terror top takatan board gabonga doug still haven't used our normal summon yet go for entrance entrance you know, get the normal summon tour guide we could have made again we could have made a interruption before going for that but yeah cherry carry cherry carry detach to get our better luck next time better luck next time to get us leon we go overlay for levier and levier since um the very first you know monster we used here was uh wind we go for leon and we get to overlay these into totem bird and now we have a spell trap negation plus a uh, monster negation and that could be really interesting because now it may be harder for them to play through our our, our situation and uh you know gabonga to steal a monster i personally like you don't have to attach one to gabonga on end phase because um if gabonga leaves you don't want to banish like one of your essential goblin bikers that's why i got rid of boom mock here just as a precaution and also i didn't use uh, mean merciless i summoned a second tour guide off of tour guide because i didn't want my mean merciless to get banished out of rotation especially when we've already resolved our levier so now um i've seen a lot of hype about super heavy samurai goblin biker and i think this can be a really interesting uh going first build for goblin i don't think super heavy samurai as an engine is great at going second but for going first it may be pretty strong at allowing us to uh, play around a lot of things just because of uh, bike and because of ghost ogre it may again it, it may be hard to like keep this in post side but like maybe in like a game one scenario where they may not be expecting much we can play like um the super heavy samurai combo to make merry maker into sargus and because this was four summons our fifth summon can be regulus to equip the motorbike and then we can go dug charger and then you can use Sargus here to bounce back your motorbike if you really want to keep it in hand. You don't have to, but it's just a funny thought, right? Uh, then we get to go Grand Entrance. 
you detach from Sargus and being having Sargus here with three materials is actually pretty amazing because that allows us to extend like crazy because we already have that exceed monster. If we didn't open the motorbike, we'd have to link this off for something like gravity controller to resolve our Regulus. So it's really good that Sargus is here or that we can have both the Sargus and the Regulus thanks to opening motorbike. So now we get to go for Gabonga. Gabonga, get Clatter, Ogre to Fortress, detach. And again, make sure you detach your Mean Merciless. You're gonna detach the two. Uh, detach Summon. Effect Summon Clatter. Clatter, Summon uh, Kabonga. Overlay Dark Knight. Overlay into Cicada King. And yeah, I mean, I guess you could have made the Crystal Zero Lancer here, but this is still a pretty solid uh, scenario. If you don't use your Regulus Negate, then you get to keep it for the opponent's turn, which it's an Omni, but if you do use the Regulus Negate, it's not the end of the world either. Sargus is still a pretty solid interruption during the opponent's turn. It was the original Gabanga, basically. It gets to choose between bouncing or popping a card on field, so you can choose to, like, bounce one of your own Exceed monsters if they, like, if you feel like they're going to try to target it, like Gabanga. Because I still feel like one Gabonga is the best number. I've never felt the need to play a second one. Maybe there there might be some grind games that change my mind, but uh, I've never felt a need for a second Gabonga going into a lot of matchups. So I'm probably going to keep the card at one. And Sargus here is still pretty strong. And I also like that if you guys didn't know, the super heavy combo can also go into Gear Gigant, which can search Terra Top, and Terra Top being a one card starter into Gabonga, into the rest of the engine, is also really strong. So if you don't open any starters and you open super heavy, that's why super heavy is really convenient at this line. And if you do open starters and you do open super heavy and you use super heavy first and, and it gets um, ash blossomed or impermed or what have you, you've eaten a negate before your turn has even started. So that's good because you haven't committed actually anything to the board yet. And you still have like, let's say they wait till like Gyrgyzgan, you still have the, those XC materials ready to be used. So that's pretty cool. So I guess uh, the last scenario is a little test hand showing you guys the power of D Fissure, right? And now th this is like a little older. Um, I, I recorded this like months back when Goblin Biker first came out. And so, you know, we, we made Gossip Shadow, we made uh, Gabonga. And in this scenario, you never have to worry about Droll. You never have to worry about Droll through uh, D-Fissure, so you can kind of just play your turn. And it's really convenient because none of your monsters get banished thanks to the D-Fissure. So D-Fissure plus Gossip Shadow is really strong. As long as every monster in your graveyard is getting sent there as an XC material and not as a face-up monster for uh, Exceed Summon, you're golden. And you get to do the exact same line, Dark Knight Lancer, uh, Mean Merciless, you get to go Cherry Carry, better luck next time, Dark Knight Lancer, shuffle back, and then we get to go Grand Bash, Grand Bash can recycle one of our, our and then the Grand Bash gets us an extra normal summon, and then we can use uh, Entrance to recycle one of our um, Goblin Bikers from Graveyard, and we can normal summon it. Uh, we get a second normal summon thanks to Grand Bash, and then we can make both our Doug and our Mean Merciless level 6. Like the overlay into Evasor Lars. Uh, you could also do Beatrice. Is Beatrice in the extra deck? No. Uh, but you could also do Beatrice to do the line where you mill... Please tell me it's in here. No, it's not in here. Uh, you could also mill Rollback plus the Ghost Meets Girl Mayakashi. And I don't think that's a terrible line to make. It is a bit vulnerable if you aren't opening like multiple engine. Like we open like three engine cards here, like uh, Tour Guide, e Telly, Wielder. So, yeah. Um. And yeah, end fades. You get to shuffle back uh, the Chariot Carry to draw one. And this is what I meant meant by like before a certain point, I was not a utopic future believer because I was not playing Utopic Future here. Uh, the Mary was just going to, I mean, the Chariot Carry was just gonna go back to, was always just going back to Extra Deck here. But yeah, I mean, that's one, two, three interruptions. Uh, then if you, uh, and then Gabonga can attach one during end phase so that Clatter is live immediately. So you detach the uh, Doug, summon Clatter, and that's four interruptions, uh, and then Gabonga can swallow one, so that's that's four, and then that'll make 
Dark Knight Lancer, five interruptions through Dimensional Fissure. And all of our XC materials are still being sent to Graveyard, so we're not really losing out on anything with D Fissure on field. Maybe if you play D Fissure, it may be worth to play double copies of certain cards here and there, but I think D Fissure overall, like overall, I think Gabonga is still a one of. I don't think Lars is, is a staple, but it is an option if you choose to play Grand Bash. And it's really personal preference. I think this is just a good scenario to look at the way that D Fissure can change your uh, lines. It, it, it does play around Droll and it beats Valor as well. So those are two hand traps that this single continuous spell shuts down. In some ways, this is just as strong as a cross out or a called by because those would be cards that you would be called buying or using cross out on without actually needing to resolve the cross out or the called by. So that's why this is such a goaded card. And I may go back into this card in the future uh, of my Goblin Biker list just because it's so convenient. And I never link summon in this deck. I don't think SP is a staple at all. I think you can. I made it to 37th place at a regional without using SP. I've beaten multiple Snake Eye players using Dimensional Fissure. I think you can definitely make it far. Some people don't know how to play through D Fissure. Like Shifter, they may be able to, to survive a turn, but through a D Fissure, some people just don't know how to play through it. So you may just get some wins because they don't know how to uh, interact or deal with this card. So going back into some of the potential engines, right? So we have Tour Guide as a starter engine, Terratop as a starter engine, Etelia as a starter engine, and then Ziamin as a starter engine. And so if you're going to use the Punk Synchro, uh, Foxy Tune, or not Foxy Tune, Deer Note is the sub piece that you want to play. But if you want to just focus on level three axis, um, Madame Spider is still the best way to go about it. I think in the new version of Goblin Biker, like post with this format i think you should be playing triple this is the one card starter that gets you to everything maybe a rota could be good as well because like rota searches for this and uh that gives you more lines into your goblin biker plays maybe cutting down on entrance keeping entrance at one or two is also the right play because you don't want to entrance into this you want to use this to get into entrance and i think one of every other goblin biker is fine you could bump clatter to two that's personal preference but i think one of every other goblin biker is fine buzzsaw i really like it's not a staple but it's the easiest access into a negate that you have throughout the entire deck it's just one summon one summon overlay toad so toad on fourth summon on top of being able to overlay bahamut into armadic seed means like even if you get drolled on the armadic seed search you're still doing well you still did pretty well for yourself if anything, I think it just, if you get trolled on Doug Charger, maybe you don't wanna, it, it's hard for me to say. I think it's better to use Fortress first than it is to get trolled on Doug Charger. At least if you detach the materials from Fortress, it has no materials, you can just set the full armament exceed and that is an interruption. Whereas if you wait, until or if you use Doug Charger, Doug Charger needs to search Grand Entrance, which searches another card, right? So if you get drolled on Doug Charger, it's just worthless. So I think it's better to just lose the Exceed Armor Fortress than it is anything else. Nianian, I still think is a staple. I think Tactics is a staple still. Mutter Spiders, I don't know if people will like this or if they think Varu Dras is worth the slots that it takes up, the Super Heavy Samurai combo, I think a lot of people are going to be on this stuff just because it's really convenient. Gold Pride stuff is more of an extender engine than a starter engine, and drawing any one of these two before going into Cherry Carry can hurt sometimes, but sometimes it helps as well because you're, you're already playing Punks and Leon just being able to summon itself from hand is helpful. And if you want to go for something like Totem Bird, you have to play Leon. Like, I can't imagine playing Totem Bird without Leon in, in the list. So just keep that in mind. You could play totem bird without it because of terra top but i just don't think that's like real and then horus i've already explained why horus is really tough i've also kind of theoried out like if someone's on bestials and you know they're on a list with bestials you may want to play like Domitef so that when you're discarding for your horus cards you're not getting caught off guard by a bestial you can uh, if you open king's arc drop on mill Domitef, drop on mill happy and then now you have two level eights that cannot be touched by a bestial it sort of like makes you a little more resilient to certain hand traps so yeah i don't like the ghost trick line personally because it plays too hard into every hand trap like it, it every hand trap beats the ghost trick line 
And I understand the Ghost Trick line is great, but using a three slot stack, it's good. It just doesn't feel like it's worth it in the greater scheme of things. I'd much rather, and I don't want to draw Ghost Trick Shot. If I draw Ghost Trick Shot, it's actually worthless in any given hand. And I still think Madam might be worth it because of Gabu, so I'm not sure. But I think if you want to play Deer Note, I don't know if playing Foxy Tune at three is the right number because having Foxy Tune as a starter when Deer Note is your goal just doesn't work. You'll go Foxy Tune summon Ziamen, and then if Ziamen searches Deer Note, then you can't normal summon it or you're gonna need another, uh, another punk in hand. So you're only inflating your numbers just to see more punks, but I don't know if it'll actually be worth it. And because we're not playing many links in this deck, unless you feel like playing IP or SP, you're not playing links at all. So it's really like up in the air. SP is pretty good at helping us dodge hand traps, but losing our XC materials, I think is a lot worse. And I don't think it's really helpful for us. Like you, you have to play IP plus SP, I think for SP to be at like max effectiveness. And I also don't wanna be locked out of attacking because I cleared their board. So Arminic Seed, I think is really good at playing through boards. I, Voiceless Voice is one of our hardest matchups, like just straight up. And I think Arminic Seed makes it a lot easier because with Torpedo, when you battle the Skull Guardian and Torpedo is equipped, Torpedo will negate the effect of Skull Guardian while you're battling. Meaning Skull Guardian will go down to 2050, which means basically any Exceed monster in your action that can swing over a Skull Guardian if it's equipped with Torpedo with Armin Exceed. Now, it only negates it till the, the, the end of the damage step, so it's not gonna be permanently negated. So, but the thing about that is, is that the ritual spell to float does not trigger when Skull Guardian is destroyed by battle. It only triggers when they're destroyed by a card effect or removed from field by a card effect. And Armin Exceed helps us play through both ways because either we don't target and we remove it with the Dark Knight Lancer or we uh, just swing into it with the torpedo and then torpedo it just has a continuous like effect to stop everything during the uh, uh, until the end of the damage step and it just says if the equipped monster battles until the end of the damage step your opponent can activate cards or effects also negate the effects of all face of monsters they control it's a really good card if you guys want me to like uh, work on like a meta guide for goblin biker i can definitely work on that as well there's a lot of theory here and i'm still not sure what my list is going to be post legacy of destruction i just know that i'm not going to be on horse anymore just because I want to sell my Horus engine, one, and two, I don't think it's necessary anymore. I think before Legacy of Destruction, Horus was like a staple, but now that everyone's going to be on Ghost Ogre, it may not be worth to play this engine. If the whole point is to play around hand traps, we want to play around the most amount of hand traps possible, Ghost Ogre will just completely shut down our sarcophaguses if we <laughs> let it go through. So for our extra deck here, everything before this Dragon Drive, I think is, is something of a staple. I guess you could argue that like not every build is going to be playing 90 or like a way into 90, so it's not a staple. But everything before this, I think is a staple. I think Grand Pulse is a staple. There's too many decks that, uh, this format that rely on Spawn Trap. Using this to pop like the Voiceless Barrier, I think it's pretty good as well. It's just very useful and then it still has the extra Exceed material. You can overlay it into Exceed Armor Fortress after removing something. It's just a very convenient card. I think Gossip Shadow is necessary for playing around hand traps. Torpedo is necessary for um, just its equip effects if you're going to use it. Uh, Torpedo uh, Fortress is the staple of all time. So is Dark Knight Lancer. I've heard some people debating over this card, and I'm like, there's no way. Like this card is like I make this card more than I make a Shuriken. Like a Shuriken is the stronger of the two, but you can't deny how convenient it is to make two level two level threes. Zeus is always going to be a staple in any XC deck. And then Typhon, I think, is a staple just because Full Armor Exceed gives it so much. And it's just ability to be... Um, it, it's just very convenient for the Goblin Biker deck to, to make. And it still stops a lot. It does stop Voiceless in a way because they can't use Skull Guardian Negate um, if they have low in Field or Grave. Well, while you control Typhon... Uh, it stops Snake Eyes Flameberg, and it stops a few other things from uh, activating uh, Baron and Borlode aren't in the format anymore, but that doesn't mean we necessarily take Typhon out permanently. We can just keep Typhon in for now until something else happens. And now these are the more experimental cards. Everything past this is more experimental. Dragon Drive, I've, I'm starting to warm up to it. I'm starting to warm up to the punk combos, but I'm sure you guys can let me know. Uh, 90, I think, is a staple if you're using Punk or if you decide to still keep on with the horsing. Or, like, keep on, keep oning with the horse. Uh, Shuriking, I think, is almost a staple because of its ability to attack three times and negate monster effects. But 
I can't say that, like, it's kind of like, it, it can steal some games too. I think it is really solid at what it does, and I don't think it should be underestimated how much a Shuriken adds to the deck, but I don't think it's a necessary card. I think there may be other cards you can summon more often that may be able to do more for you in different situations. Uh, Bahamut's only here because of the sharks, and I think Toad is worth it. Also, if you are, if you want to keep your Dark Knight Lancer and you want Toad to recycle something, then you can recycle the Crystal Zero Lancer. And I was actually theorying this out, right? So normally in a scenario where I, I'm a, I'm up against a Voiceless, Crystal Zero Lancer is an amazing card, right? Like going Buzzsaw into Crystal Zero is like, or Buzzsaw into uh, Rank Five like Valiant Shark Lancer to then summon Crystal Zero, it's gonna have three materials, it's gonna have like 3700 attack. And then my issue with this card was that like, I could not bait out the Skull Guardian Negate because um, if I go into it with Fortress, because to go into it with Fortress, Fortress has to be the only material. Meaning if I try to detach one to um, Dark Ruler their field, they can chain Skull Guardian, negate this and pop it. Now, which as Fortress, this card just completely loses to Skull Guardian. But if I summon it off of a Valiant Shark Lancer, which I can make with my two level four sharks, then it's gonna have three materials, meaning when I detach one to attempt to uh, Dark Ruler their field, they are going to be forced to Skull Guardian negate this, and then I can detach one to stop that destruction and still be able to overlay into uh, Dark Knight Lancer. So that's why I really like this card. And again, you can recycle it off of Toad when you're doing all those detaching combos. And then uh, like, let's say you start with Sharks and you're doing all that detaching and Crystal Zero Lancer's in Graveyard. Dark Knight Lancer can shuffle back the Exceed Armor Fortress and then um, Toad can recycle this so that even worst case scenario, you can still like overlay Fortress into making this like in a turn three and it, in, in a turn three scenario, it's not hard to detach Exceed Materials from your monsters because your grave is probably already set up with either Mean Merciless or Boom Mock. So I think that's really important. Uh, Crazy Beast has just become so much stronger with uh, pileup in, in the game. And the fact that Crazy Beast gets to detach any two materials from your field um, to swallow any spell or trap on field is actually amazing. It's a little slow still, but I do think that it, it will come up with um, pile up. And by playing more entrances and more um, duck chargers, there may be scenarios where you will be able to search pile up instead of entrance. And so that will allow you um, easier access into a car like Crazy Beast to turn any Exceed monster that's fulfilled its purpose, like a Gossip Shadow that's already detaches two materials into a Crazy Beast, and then to be able to just start to swallow your opponent's spell and trap cards and to be able to revive it from grave. Um, it's just a really great card. Totem Bird, if you feel like you need extra protection against spell and trap decks, uh, Totem Bird's your guy. Uh, Varudras, I think is a really solid uh, negation. Levier, solid. Shark Lancer, I think it's good with the shark stuff. Chariot Carry is pretty good for um, just extending your your combos extending your turn the spring and stuff if you only play the uh super heavy stuff you could get away with just playing sargus if you're playing the punk stuff like the punk uh, dragon drive into siam and if you feel like you need to like an extra exceed um that's an option real trio i still don't really have a place for this card in the deck i don't think it's a staple by any means Maybe in a shifter build it could do decently because it can negate attacks and allows you to attack directly. It makes uh, Zeus pretty easily, but you need three or more XC materials on this to make Zeus easy, so I'm not sure. But there aren't really that many, or there aren't rank three exceed monsters that can attack directly without having to detach. So this being the first monster that can do that, if you make it with three level threes, it can attack directly, overlay into a two, into a four material Zeus and be a lot more threatening. I think that that's pretty good. So mix with something like a Dark Ruler, this card could be pretty, pretty scary. Um, I've already explained my qualms with the great, with the Ghost Trick stuff. I don't think it's terrible. I just don't think it does enough. Um, and it takes up too much space for um, how fragile it is. 
Gear Gigant for Super Heavy, and then Draco Feature, which I've warmed up to now. So, um, yeah, let me know if you guys want a meta guide for this deck in the comment section below, and I'll get to working on that. But, you know, uh, there's been no new support for this deck out of Infinite Forbidden, so now that that's all said and done, I, I figured, hey, you know, uh, let me just make my hand trap guide for, for, for this point onward, and let's just see how this does. Let, let's see what uh, you guys think. And if you guys know any other ways around hand traps, against high impact hand traps, right? The low impact ones, as I said, they imp uh, they imperm here. You just do this. They stop this. You just do that, right? So uh, that's been all for now. This has been your boy Nistro here, signing out.